On this episode, we cover the adaptations of A Princess of Mars. Or as it's better known, the first novel featuring the pulp hero John Carter. Which is, coincidentally, my legal name. Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the man who may or may not have invented the shared fictional universe, but darn well perfected it. Mr. Burroughs. And then shamelessly put himself into it. He Stan Lee'd it before Stan Lee was even born. How, you may ask? Can you do an adaptation countdown with only two films? Simple. You make it a face-off. One was a record-breaking box office failure, and the other was so much worse. Continuing our endless war on subjectivity, we've come up with 72 possible points based on characters, plot, and lore. Which movie came closest to meeting Burroughs' fantastical vision? Oh, don't worry. It'll be pretty obvious soon enough. The book introduces Captain John Carter of Virginia, a Confederate cavalryman who leaves Earth behind and who can blame him when he's mysteriously transported to Mars. The 1912 novella was first adapted in 2009 with Princess of Mars on our favorite guilty pleasure, the Sci-Fi Channel. We have the name, but the hero himself is pushed into modern times and is played with distinction by Antonio Sabato Jr.'s Tramp Stamp. Disney's John Carter in 2012 gets much closer with a period-accurate hero played by Taylor Kitsch, possibly the unluckiest man in showbiz. In the book, Carter teams up with James K. Powell to go prospecting in the desert. Powell's not mentioned at all in Princess of Mars. He does show up played by Brian Cranston in John Carter, but they aren't exactly partners. After an ambush that mortally wounds Powell, John Carter is transported to Mars. How he does so is never explained in the book, kinda sorta explained in John Carter, and stupidly explained in Princess of Mars. Upon reaching the Red Planet, John Carter learns the weaker Martian gravity makes him capable of super strength and super jumping which does nothing to save him from being taken captive by the Tharks, a race of green, six-armed, 15-foot-tall warriors. As far as Disney goes, they're all but identical to the source material. In Princess of Mars, though, they are not. And we're actually kind of grateful for that. Believe it or not, this was the lesser evil. It's the classic battle of big budget against no budget. Carter is taken in by the warrior Tars Tarkas, who is spot on in Disney's version, and played by all-round classy gent Willem. There was a firefly! Defoe. In the Asylum's version, yeah, they got his name right. In both films, the Thark Sola becomes Carter's caretaker, and basically functions as a plot device to explain how Carter learns the alien tongue. Sarkozia. A super extra Martian female makes it into John Carter and leaves it in well-deserved fashion. Tal Hajus, the leader of the tribe, or Jeddak, makes it into both films too. But like Sarkozia, gets a much better death in Disney's. As John Carter adapts to the environs of Mars, he meets the Red Martians, specifically the warring cities of Zodanga and Helium. And the very first one he meets is the stunning Deja Thoris. And yes, it is pronounced Deja. We looked it up. Princess of Mars cast Tracy Lords, and if you don't know who that is, ask your dad. Apparently red is not Tracy Lords' color, or else they didn't budget for body paint. She spends the whole film moving only her mouth, presumably because of Botox. Disney's casting got something very, very right for a change with Lynn Collins, who may be the best part of the entire movie. Be still, my black heart. Moving on, we also get Kantos Khan, a loyal helium soldier in both films, though he's far cooler in John Carter thanks to James Purefoy. Though to be honest, we have a soft spot for pretty much anyone who is in Knight's Tale. 
We love Knight's Tale. Tardos Moores is DJ Thoris' grandfather in the book, yet her father in John Carter, and absent completely in Princess of Mars. Where's Daddy? Is he ever coming home? The villain in every version is Sab Than, who is a vile Zodangan prince in the book and John Carter, but gets a radically different backstory in Princess of Mars. Which should not surprise you by now. One of the few times Princess Amar scores one over John Carter is the presence of the Air Factory Keeper. Who, you can probably guess, is the Keeper of the Air Factory. He's like one of the most important people on Mars and he doesn't even get a name. Of the Red Planet's wildlife, we get the horse-like thoats that appear in both films, but appear to be missing a leg or two in Princess. Budget reasons again. The imposing white apes of Mars are well represented in John Carter, but Princess of Mars went another route with super generic bug monsters. Of all of Princess of Mars' sins, its biggest is a distressing lack of Woola. The bestest boy in the whole universe, look at that face. When it comes to characters, we awarded 44 possible points, making it our biggest category. Princess Amar scores 10, and John Carter scores 30. Both films more or less follow the plot of the book, at least in the first act. Leave Earth, find Mars, jump high, meet dogs, get captured, learn language, say princess. At some point, there's a discussion of Martian history and background with Dejah Thoris. More or less just exposition. You have earned your position amongst us. As our tradition. At some point, Carter sets up the circumstances for Talhajus to die so Tars Tarkas can take over, which is way more complicated in the book for some reason. Lots of massive battles on land and in the air, during which Carter awkwardly meets his new best girl's family. Princess of Mars heavily streamlined the plot, but only because of its budget limitations. Its heart was in the right place. To its credit, it hews much closer to Burroughs' original ending. Give or take ten years of being married to Deja Thoris. Rawr. Wherein John Carter races to save an ancient atmospheric plant before its failure kills all life on Mars. But he is cast back to Earth before finding out if he succeeded or not. For all these deviations, possibly meant to be explored in later films that never happened, both movies scored surprisingly low. Out of 28 points, Princess of Mars got only four, and John Carter only slightly better at seven. Leading us to the grand total, Princess of Mars got 14 out of 72, John Carter scored 37. Good God. And there you have it. John Carter is an objectively closer adaptation, and we feel a better movie overall. Turn off the sound for Princess of Mars, and you couldn't even tell what you're supposed to be watching. That being said, both were guilty of leaving out the most important part of the book. Indeed, the most important part of Burroughs' entire fictional universe. Martian women totally lay eggs. Yeah, that's in your head now. Live with it. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for hanging out with us, like and subscribe.